Hello learners, welcome back to the course on labor welfare and industrial relations. Today we move to the fourth lecture of the fourth module where we look into social security measures. Specifically, we look into the evolution of social security measures, we look into the history, we look into how it has evolved over the time period and we will also try to understand some of the provisions, uh, welfare provisions in some of the important labor laws. I am Abraham Sir Lysak. I am an assistant professor at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. So when we look into uh, social security, we have to understand social security is something which, which brings the worker back to the workplace without having any sort of uh, issues or uh, troubles or disturbances or irritation. So this would be the background in understanding what social security is. When you look into social security, there are different organizations and different theoreticians who have given different definitions. Let's follow the ILO principle. According to ILO, social security can be taken to mean the protection which society provides for its members through a series of public measures. So it is not one, it is not two, it would be a series of public measures against the economic and social distress that otherwise would be caused by the stoppage or substantial reduction of earnings resulting from sickness. It could be maternity, it could be employment injury, it could be unemployment, invalidity, old age, death, the provision of medical care and the provision of subsidies for families with children. So generally a holistic definition that ILO has given includes all these critical aspects ranging from sickness to uh, provision specifically for subsidies as well as you know for provision for medical care. So when you look into social security it warrants a certain bit of discussion because it has a concern towards a lot of critical issues that are happening within the realm of workplace. So when you look into the basic scope of social security we have two important aspects one is social insurance and another is social assistance. Social insurance is all about periodic contributions by workers and employers to a fund with or without the government subsidy. So this would be significant. It might be that the government is government of the day is providing something as a subsidy or maybe a part of the contribution is coming from the side of the government or it may also happen that the employer has to take care of it or there's an equal contribution coming from employer or a significant contribution coming from employer or a lesser contribution from employee. That could be the case providing benefits during old age. It could be retirement, sickness, disability or unemployment. So all the factors which we try to define social security will actually become relevant when it comes to social insurance. When you look into social assistance per se, it is a non-contributory, please note, it's a non-contributory benefit from the government for the maintenance of children, mothers, invalids, disabled and unemployed individuals specifically. So when you look into the social assistance, it is non-contributory in nature. Uh, it could be sort of a grant, it could be sort of help from the authorities, but mainly when it comes to social insurance, what we see is that there is an equal contribution from the part of the employer or from the part of the government as in the case of any particular, let's say it could be ESI, it could be any such measures which, which generally government adapt to. When you look into the types of economic insurances, because when you are looking into social insurances, we have to understand what are the different types of economic insurances. The first one is workers provident fund. When you look into workers provident fund, it's, it provides retirement and family pensions for workers covering almost 35 million individuals. Again, the data could be revised to the latest estimates, but what I would like to underscore here is that it is the PF that secures a social fabric. It gives a social net for the individuals. When you look into mortality on the job or the Workers' Pension Association, which is a component of Ministry of Labor and Industries, is liable for retirement and family pensions. If you look into the Indian population per se, only around 35 million individuals have access to the legislator public protection nets in the form of old age income security. So this is alarming. When you look into 
ഓൾഡ് ഏജ് ഇൻകം സെക്യൂരിറ്റി ഉള്ളി തേർട്ടി ഫൈവ് മില്യൺ ഇൻഡിവിജ്വൽസ് ഹാവ് ആക്സസ് ടു ലെജിസ്ലേറ്റഡ് പബ്ലിക് പ്രൊട്ടക്ഷൻ നെറ്റ്സ് ആൻഡ് ദ എംപ്ലോയീസ് പ്രൊവിഡൻറ്റ് ഫണ്ട് ഓർഗനൈസേഷൻ വിച്ച് സേ കംപ്രൈസസ് ട്വൻറ്റി സിക്സ് മില്യൺ ഓഫ് ദ തേർട്ടി ഫൈവ് മില്യൺ എംപ്ലോയേഴ്സ് ഇൻക്ലൂസ് പേഴ്സണൽ വർക്കേഴ്സ് ഗവൺമെൻറ് എംപ്ലോയീസ് ലെറ്റ്സ് എ മിലിറ്ററി പേഴ്സണൽ സ്റ്റാഫ് ഓഫ് സ്റ്റേറ്റ് പ്രൈവറ്റ് പ്രോപ്പർട്ടി അണ്ടർടേക്കിങ്സ് എക്സെട്രാ സോ വെൻ യു ലുക്ക് ഇൻ ടു ദ ഇ പി ഒ ദ എംപ്ലോയീസ് പ്രൊവിഡൻറ്റ് ഫണ്ട് ഓർഗനൈസേഷൻ ഇനീഷ്യേറ്റീവ്സ് ദ ആർ അവൈലബിൾ ടു ബിസിനസ്സസ് വിത്ത് എ മിനിമം ഓഫ് അറ്റ് ലീസ്റ്റ് ട്വൻറ്റി എംപ്ലോയീസ് സോ ഡൊണേഷൻസ് ടു ദ വർക്കേഴ്സ് ഇവാക്യുവേഷൻ ഫണ്ട് ഇ പി എഫ് പ്രോഗ്രാം ആർ നെസസറി ഫോർ ബോത്ത് ദ ഫേം ആൻഡ് ദ ഇൻഡിവിജ്വൽ വെൻ എ വർക്കർ ഏൺസ് അപ് ടു ഇൻ ടേംസ് ഓഫ് ഡോളേഴ്സ് ഇറ്റ് വിൽ ബി ടു ഹൺഡ്രഡ് ഫൈവ് ഡോളേഴ്സ് പെർ ക്വാർട്ടർ ആൾമോസ്റ്റ് ഈക്വൽ ആൻഡ് ടു ദ ഐ എൻ ആർ ഫിഫ്റ്റീൻ തൗസൻഡ് ഇന്ത്യൻ റുപ്പീസ് സോ ദാറ്റ് വുഡ് മേക്ക് വോളൻറ്ററി കോൺട്രിബ്യൂഷൻ മോർ സിഗ്നിഫിക്കൻറ്റ് സോ ഇഫ് എ കമ്പനീസ് പേ എക്സീസ് ദിസ് ത്രഷ് ഹോൾഡ് ദ ബിസിനസ് കോൺട്രിബ്യൂഷൻസ് വുഡ് ബി ലിമിറ്റഡ് ടു ദ എമൗണ്ട്സ് പേയബിൾ ഓൺ ദ ഫസ്റ്റ് ഐ എൻ ആർ ഫിഫ്റ്റീൻ തൗസൻഡ് സോൾഡ്ലി സോ ദിസ് ഇസ് സം വാട്ട് വി അണ്ടർസ്റ്റാൻഡ് ഇൻ ടേംസ് ഓഫ് ദ വർക്കേഴ്സ് പ്രൊവിഡൻറ്റ് ഫണ്ട് ദ സെക്കൻഡ് മോസ്റ്റ് ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് കാറ്റഗറി ഹിയർ വുഡ് ബി ദ ഹെൽത്ത് കെയർ സർവീസസ് വെൻ യു ലുക്ക് ഇൻ ടു ദ ഹെൽത്ത് കെയർ സർവീസസ് ദ എംപ്ലോയി സ്റ്റേറ്റ് ഇൻഷുറൻസ് സിസ്റ്റം പ്രൊവൈഡ്സ് മെഡിക്കൽ ട്രീറ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് monetary benefits and monthly payments for workers in companies with 10 plus employees now this is certainly universal healthcare system what india has but it cannot meet all the healthcare demands of the people and that is what we have observed let's say we have the workers state security act of 1948 state security act of 1948 that which created funds to provide Uh, medical treatment as well as monetary benefits during illness pregnancy and even monthly reimbursements in case of mortality or incapacity for individuals working in companies and organizations so the esi system specifically presently uh, covers hostels it covers retailers cinema and showcasing theaters eateries newspaper stations and highway enterprises so business education and clinical institutions with let's say 10 or more staff are now eligible to participate in this initiatives what we have understood that healthcare services have been more successful when compared to the workers provident fund to a certain extent because people are more concerned nowadays with the healthcare schemes with the increasing and burgeoning healthcare expenses it is a matter of time that people will adhere more and more or more and more compliance will come to healthcare services when you look into other social security benefits india has a universal healthcare a uh, service though it cannot meet all the healthcare demands as i already mentioned but when you look into specific social security measures we have the disability coverage we have the maternity benefits and we have the child care support so the workers insurance act of 1923 specifically provides compensation to workers who acquire industrial illness or injuries on the job so this is a significant disability coverage that that india has with the workers insurance act often referred to as the workmen's insurance act of 1923 a person who acquires an industrial illness Uh, is regarded to have been hurt on the job and is entitled to compensation from his or her employer so that's basically the the qualification criteria for the disability coverage when you look into the maternity benefits act or the maternity benefit which is also covered under the maternity welfare act nowadays 2017 uh, which took effect on april 1 2017 expanding some of the key benefits of proceeding maternity benefit act 1961 so the first two children the new legislation gives females in the unorganized industry now get up to 26 weeks of paid parental vacation and up from 12 months before when you look into the third kid will be eligible for 12 weeks of maternity leave uh, specifically india has now world's third longest maternity leave after only canada which is having i think 50 weeks and norway again with 50 weeks so world's third longest maternity leave obviously is an achievement in itself the act provides for 12 weeks of parental uh, vacation for moms who acquire a kid under the age of 3 months as well as commissioning a uh, women who chose uh, to surrogate the 12 week term specifically if you look into would start when the child is handed up to the adopted or commissioned mom in those cases so furthermore any any firm with children than less than 50 employees must 
provide actually crush services which we have talked about extensively in the previous lecture within an acceptable strolling range so which the mom might use up to four hours a week so specifically for regulatory purpose businesses must be informed that this rule would take effect from june 2017 so this is some the biggest updates that come from the maternity angle when you look into the child support as i've already mentioned uh, we have firms with over 50 employees must provide a crush services and that is uh, a reasonable distance which mothers can use up to let's say four hours per week when you are looking into social security specifically you have to understand that things have changed from what we had in the previous pre-independence era let's say we have time and again tried to underscore this understanding that before independence we did not have the autonomy we did not have the power in our hand there were a lot of uh, colonial mindset and a lot of uh, thought process and rules and policies emerging out of those mindsets but after the pre-british era things have changed there has been a, a gradual holistic evolution of the social security measure specifically when you look into uh, the different acts and its updates as i already mentioned even uh, the maternity benefit act etc so all these aspects have become more significant more relevant but that's it to understand uh, the evolution of uh, specifically the social measures within the ambit of industrial relations we have to dwell uh, deeper into what we understand as the pre british era so let's look into that very quickly in pre british India social welfare payments and public services were available under the Mughal Empire the rural economy was self-sufficient with the division of labor based specifically on caste system so this was more prominent in the pre-British pre era specifically where you look into the entire scheme of things you see that a caste based division was pretty much there when you look into uh, the things after uh, the pre-British era, during the British colonialization, the British discovered India as a source of raw materials and cheap labor, which we have read, which you have understood, leading to the collapse of India's handicraft industry. So this was the first blow we met when, when the British actually took charge of the Indian subcontinent and which ultimately or consequently increased poverty and insecurity among the population. So more than two centuries india was ruled by british so pre-british time social welfare payments uh, though it was given by uh, was pretty much significant during the mughal empire other social services were also available to comprehend critically the situation of social security in the pre-british india we have to understand the socio-economic framework that existed during the time so india had a very self-sufficient rural economy uh, before the British invasion, which we talk even uh, nowadays, based on the, the basic division of labor. But that said, when you look into the jobs were primarily hereditary, meaning they were handed down through generations. The food produced in the settlement was eaten entirely by the villagers. So as a result, the issue of economic safety was never ever raised. So that was one of the critical aspects when, when it came to the government support being lacking. The British government at the time took little steps to resettle the unemployed leading to a worsening of the plight of the jobless population specifically. So if you look into the, the history in further detail, you'll see that during the 1850s, a strategy of agriculture commercialization, which I'll uh, discuss in the coming portions also, uh, agriculture commercialization arose with production moving away from family. So 14 food crops were uh, replaced by cash crops. So it was more of commercialization that was happening. Surplus crop production led to the establishment of all the commercial marketplaces and the towns and cities emerged as a result of this surplus trade. So food production fell as a consequence of this strategy specifically leading to famines throughout the nation. So this was India's first serious food crisis or insecurity which we have seen over the past so when you look into the agriculture commercialization we have to critically understand the impact of british rule on the social security so 1850s uh, agriculture commercialization arose leading to the replacement of uh, what i've already mentioned food crops to cash crops and when you look into this aspect more of commercialization happened the food crops were scarce the shift to cash crops resulted in fall of this production and then 
gender, generally led to famine. So basically, uh, food in insecurity was this critical aspect that could be understood from what we had when we had the British rule. Industrialization and labor issues were there, the growth of factories specifically. Uh, and industries such as the plantation business created jobs but also led to low wages and harsh working conditions. So there was exploitation that was happening within the industrialization or within the, uh, the mask of industrialization. So societal challenges were there. The expansion of the modern manufacturing system was accompanied by social and economic uncertainty, uh, population growth and urbanization. So when you look into the social security being uh, uh, in a uh, in such a dilapidated condition, if I can use the word, then we have to understand the importance of social security measures in India from that background and that will make us more sensitive towards appreciating and acknowledging what existing uh, important social security legislations we have in India. I'll start from the left. We have the Employees Provident Fund Act 1952, the Payment of Gratuity Act 1972, the Workmen's Compensation Act 1923, the Employees State Insurance Act 1948, the Maternity Benefits Act 1961. So most of them we have already touched upon, but the background has to be understood as I've already mentioned to acknowledge and appreciate the existing important social security legislations in India. When you look into those important social security measures in India, I would like to uh, discuss a few, especially the most critical one, the Workmen's Compensation Act 1923. Now this is very critical because the government of India passed this act to impose upon employers an obligation to pay compensation to workers for accidents arising out of and in the course of employment. So this was an employer obligation that gave some breathing space to the employees. So basically we'll see that whatever be uh, the workers who operate, maybe they are operating in industries, it could be mining, it could be crops, it could be manually powered equipment or railroads, spectacles, ships, building sites, etc. All other dangerous activities uh, may be listed in the appendix 2 of the statute are covered by this act. So, Something which has to be noted here is that the armed forces, informal laborers and workers protected by the Workers' State Security Statute of 1948 are exempt from this act. So that was the relevance of Workmen's Compensation Act. It created a certain obligation, an employer obligation to pay compensation for the workers and this made it all the more important within the scheme of social security measures in India. Another important measure is the Workers' State Insurance Act of 1948, uh, the Employee State ESI, what we call as the ESI scheme. The Workers' State Insurance Act was enacted in 1948. The, the act was enacted to specifically offer medical care and job security to in industrial employees who were uh, specifically ill. So this act offers certain medical advantages to covered individuals and their relatives in form of uh, professional attention, uh, medication, treatment, injections, when the option has been provided to the household as well. So these are some of the aspects which generally are covered under the Workers' State Insurance Act specifically. Yet another important act which we have already touched upon is the Maternity Benefits Act, one of the, uh, the game changer in the entire social security uh, scheme, I would say. Uh, the Government of India enacted specifically the Maternity Benefits Act of 1961 to provide uniform standards for maternity protection. So it was implemented in the first instance to all the mines, factories, plantation workers, except those to which the Employee State Insurance Act applied specifically. So that would be the exemption which you should note. This act specifically was amended. The 1961 act was amended in 1976 to extend the benefit to all workers even covered by the ESI Act specifically. So we'll see that the Maternity Benefits Act 1961 also covers all most of the industries including factory, mine, plantation workers etc. which makes it more comprehensive and more productive and useful. Another important act would be the Workers Provident Fund Act 1952. 
The Workers Provident Fund Act 1952, obviously enacted in 52, workers are eligible for pension advantages. It could be the Provident Fund, uh, familial pensions and payment coverage under the Workers Provident Fund and other act Articles Act 1952. So specifically, this act covers any factory in any of the industries listed in, in Schedule A that employs 20 or more people or that the central administration announces in the federal register. The act was not applicable to collaborative organizations with fewer than 50 members that operate in the absence of the use of electricity. When you also look into the acts, we should understand the Gratuity Compensation Act of 1972. The Payment of Gratuity uh, Compensation Act, it applies to all factories, mines, oil fields, ports, plantations, railways, ships or establishments with 10 or more workers as employed, which has been clearly demarcated. So all employees and workers working in this establishment are, are entitled to receive gratuity irrespective of the number of their wages. The government of India is empowered under the act to extend this act to any establishment. So that's the beauty of this act. Not only there is a restriction, but it can be enacted or it can be established or it can be extended to any of the establishment. So the amount of gratuity specifically is payable on retirement, death, disablement or termination subject to the condition that the employee has at least rendered five years of continuous service with the same employer. So gratuity is payable at the rate of 15 days wages for each year of completed service or part thereof subject to a maximum of 20 months wages or rupees 3,50,000 whichever is uh, lower specifically. So the gratuity is payable on retirement, death, disablement or termination. The reason or the condition being subject to five-year uh, continuous service uh, retirement or before the requirement actually happens. So what we have seen here is that there are some critical measures that the government of India or the legislative body has come up with certain legislations which actually are catering to the needs of the social welfare of the workers specifically. Now, if we have to understand and appreciate these social welfare schemes, we have to understand the need of these social welfare schemes. We have to understand the evolution of the social welfare schemes. That is where specifically I mentioned that uh, if you look into the pre-British era, there was Mughal Empire and there was other, other Sultanate and other rulings that were there, other, other empires were there. All of them had their own share of some social security angle to it. But whatever happened till that time, till the independence, it was more of lack of autonomy which protected, which prevented people from enacting some of the legislations like what we have today. But things have changed after independence. More of autonomy has come. More of sense of ownership has come. It is our people. It is our brother. It is our sisters that we are going to help with these acts. That notion, that sense of belongingness has actually taken up the social security measures to this extent. That said, there are still some lacunae, there are still some problems, but there are acts in different, different areas, different dimensions. Only requirement is to make the acts more powerful or more emboldened. That's what the aim is. And thank you for listening to me in this lecture. We looked into the entire evolution of the social security benefits specifically and some important aspects within social security. See you in the next lecture with more details. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.